Our customer brought us this three-cylinder Kubota engine out of a lawn tractor, which had experienced overheating followed by catastrophic failure due to an exhaust seat falling out of the head. The challenge we're faced with is determining whether we can fix the damage to the cylinder head and cylinder block at a reasonable labor cost, or whether they're better off scrapping the project and finding a new engine. As always, the first step in the process is to thoroughly clean any components that we plan on working on so that our inspection can be as thorough as possible. Since we know the head has been severely overheated, we'll especially be checking for cracks as well as warpage. With a straight edge set across the cylinder head, we can use a 3000th feeler gauge to see how bad the warp is. The feeler gauge sits tight on both the front and back side of the cylinder head, but slides completely freely under most of the center section of the head, indicating that we have at least 3000th warp. In fact, a 5000th feeler gauge slips under as well, so we're expecting it will require between 6 to 10 thousandths off the surface. We will be recommending that the customer gets new valves, springs, and valve seats at the minimum for the head, but we also want to check the valve stem clearance with our bore gauge. All of the valve guides look to be in acceptable condition, and as such do not need to be replaced. Finally, we're going to pop out the rest of that valve seat that finished off the engine and do a quick magnetic particle inspection for cracks. You might be wondering why we would go to all the trouble of cleaning the head before we ever checked for cracks, but we have learned that it's much easier to identify cracks if the part is completely clean, so it's just become a part of our process. Surprisingly, not a single crack was found in the cylinder head, despite the heat that it has obviously experienced. Now, before having the customer go to all the trouble of ordering the new parts, we need to see if it will even be possible to get an oversized seat in the exhaust position of the center cylinder. During the failure, a large chunk of the casting broke out of the head, so we wouldn't be comfortable putting a factory sized seat back into that damaged counterboard. Instead, we'll set up the head on our valve seat machine and use the setting micrometer to set up a cutter to cut to the next closest oversize, which happens to be 1 and 1 16th inch OD. On most valve seats, if they're listed as a nominal fractional size, such as 1 and 1 16th, it means that the counterbore should be cut to that exact diameter, while the seat actually will measure several thousandths of an inch more to achieve the proper press fit. Our valve seat machine utilizes several air floats and a pilot to center itself and align itself perfectly on the valve guide before everything is locked rigid and machining can begin. As we open up the diameter of the counterbore, pay attention to the far side where the damage is. Our goal is to open up the diameter far enough to a point where we feel comfortable with the contact area of the seat on that side of the valve, while not cutting the counterbore any deeper than the original bore, and hopefully not cutting through into the water jacket. We don't feel that 1 and 1 16th got us enough material there to keep a seat in place, so we reset our cutter and are bumping it up to the next oversize of 1 and 1 8th inch. Real quick everyone, if you enjoy the videos, the best way to support us is absolutely free. Drop a comment, hit the like button, and subscribe, as nearly 80% of you are currently not subscribed. And if you want to go the extra mile, send this video to a friend or share it on Facebook and be sure to tag us. It doesn't look perfect, but at this size we're comfortable that we can install a new seat and have enough surface area for our press fit to hold. This is quite a bit larger than the factory seat size, so we decided we should stop before we thin it out too far and hit the water jacket, condemning the head. Checking with my knife in the corner of the counterbore, it seems like we still have plenty of meat at this size. Finally, before ordering a new seat, I double checked the counterbore measurement, which came in just shy of 1 and 1 8 inch, so if anything, we'll actually have a bit more press than intended by the valve seat manufacturer, which helps us feel a little bit more confident in the repair. After we check the ID of the factory exhaust seats, we can jump into the catalog and find a part number that suits our needs. In this case, we'll start with a seat that's the right OD, smaller IDs that we can open up later, and thicker than needed that can also be trimmed once installed. Since we have to wait for our valve seat to come in the next order, we decided to go ahead and reinstall the pre-chambers into the head before we head over to the surfacer. They're a snug fit, but I added some retaining compound and then clamped it in the press for a while just to make sure that they're fully seated and stay in place when we surface. What are you working on? Oh, well, this Kubota thing. What's for lunch? I hadn't really given it much thought. I get tired of cooking all the time. I know, but I'm hungry. Huh? I've been working hard out here. There it goes. Maybe you should take care of some lunch yourself. You really gonna make me cook? Well, you're a good cook, so. All right, I Just guess. Just I'm the cook, doesn't mean I'm the only cook. Well, fine, I'll cook today. Okay. A lot of you guys know that we refer to my mom as the cook because we are a family-owned business and she does actually cook lunch for us almost every single day, but Apparently today she doesn't want to. 
Luckily, we are sponsored by Husk for this video, and they have been nice enough to send us one of their high quality Japanese inspired kitchen knives. So while I whip up some fajitas real quick, I'll give you a rundown on Husk knives. The handle consists of a high quality oak wood with a curved blade and a grip hole that enables better precision and handling. The knife is lightweight yet durable and sturdy, sitting at 28 centimeters in length and weighing only 252 grams. And of course, Husk knives come out of the box razor sharp and the blade dulls so slowly that you won't even notice. Currently, for all my viewers, Husk is running a 70% discount on their authentic Japanese inspired knives. You can test the Husk knife with a 30 day money back guarantee and this deal won't last for long, so make sure to check it out by clicking my special link in bio. The knife feels great in the hand whether you're using the grip hole or not, but personally I do like using the grip hole here and you can see it just does great for making these thin strips with this steak. And again, for all of my viewers, Husk is running a 70% discount on their authentic Japanese inspired knives. You can test the Husk knife with a 30 day money back guarantee. This deal won't last for long, so make sure to check it out by clicking my special link in bio. Lunch turned out great, so we're gonna eat real quick and get back to work. Ideally, I would have waited to surface the head before installing the valve seat in case the seat ends up too tall. But in the real world, you have to keep moving on the parts of the project that you have while the machines are available. Although I know this head will take at least five thousandths, if not more, to get it fully flat again, I'm going to make my cuts in smaller two-thou increments since the steel pre-chambers are installed and the cutter doesn't like the steel as much as it likes cast iron. By taking it slow and spraying a small film of oil on the surface before each pass, we're left with a great surface finish even with the steel pre-cups. One thing to keep in mind here is that the center cylinder does have some extensive damage from the piston slamming that piece of exhaust seat into the head over and over. Most of this probably won't clean up, but as long as the areas where the head gasket seals are flat, we'll be in good shape. And it took a total of about eight and a half thousandths off of the surface to get there. The next morning, we were ready to make the install on the replacement exhaust seat. However, we first used an angle cutter to lightly chamfer the top of the board to ease in the installation and prevent any possible galling or other issues. With a pilot and the valve guide to guide our driver, the new seat was hammered into place and from experience, it felt like a very good amount of press fit. As you can tell, the ID of the new seat does need opened up and the seat is indeed too tall and will need trimmed. By zeroing a 90 degree cutter on the surface of the head, we have a reference point for how much we need to trim off of the top of the seat. The factory exhaust seats actually sat a bit low in the counterbores, so we went ahead and set up a cutter to the same diameter as the factory counterbore and counterbored the new seat to match. While it may not be necessary, it sure does look nice. Finally, we came in with a cutter to open up the ID of the new valve seat to match the factory. This blended very well into the port of the head with the exception of one spot, which I cleaned up really quickly with a touch of a carbide burr. So at this point, we're 100% confident that this head can be saved. It's just a matter of how much replacement parts for this head will cost compared with the cost of a new aftermarket head, as well as the balance of final end product quality between the two. Again, this head will need all new valves, new intake and exhaust seats since one more intake and one more exhaust were starting to drop as often happens in overheats, as well as new springs as they have been destroyed by the heat. Moving on to the engine block, we found no visible cracks, and while the cylinders do appear to have a bit of scuffing, you can't catch it with a fingernail, so we're optimistic that it isn't actually that bad. While ideally we would throw the block in the hone first to make sure, we're going to start on the surfacer because that's the machine that's currently available. This block made me question my setup to the point of completely tearing everything down and double checking the mill, but sure enough, it was true, despite the block reading a few thousands off from one side to the other. Having the confidence that our machine is true, we're going to go ahead and square up the deck. The deck of the block is typically a bit more resilient when it comes to warping from overheating, but it does still often mirror the warp of the cylinder head. A 3,000th cut wasn't quite enough to true up the surface, but after another 1,000th finish cut, everything looked great. Again, decking first may end up making more work for myself later if we do have to do additional cylinder work like a sleeve, but obviously we wouldn't charge the customer twice. With the block moved over into our cylinder home, the plan is to basically do a few strokes in each cylinder to see if we can restore the crosshatch for the rings to seal without increasing the diameter of the cylinders past the point of being able to run standard size pistons. 
After about five strokes on this end cylinder, we can still see a bit of the scoring right at the top of the cylinder. Considering it cleaned up as well as it did, we're going to try five more strokes and see where we end up. That cleaned up the cylinder wall completely, and checking with the bore gauge, it still only measures about a thousandth big, which will be perfectly fine for this application. The opposite cylinder cleaned up well within reason, so things were looking up. However, we should all expect that the center cylinder is going to be the worst considering the damage to the head, so the fate of this block all kind of hinges on that. Some of you may already see it, but there's a dark spot on the left side of the cylinder wall where the stones from the hone haven't touched yet, and the bore gauge confirmed what we're seeing is actually essentially a dent in the cylinder wall. The cylinder measures four or five thousandths big in that area. While we have already magnifluxed the block, it's never too late for a closer inspection now that we have a spot of concern to look at closely. After cleaning the cylinder of all the honing oil and making sure it's completely dry, we can again magnaflux the block to check for cracks in that location of the cylinder wall. Nothing appeared, but we are still concerned. Before we have some closing thoughts on what we're going to recommend for our customer moving forward, the last thing I checked was the connecting rod from the center cylinder, and sure enough, it does appear to have a slight bend when compared with one of the other cylinders, which isn't surprising considering the way the piston was hammering that valve seat into the head surface. Final thoughts here on the Kubota. When it came in, you know, they bring us this mess of parts and say, hey, see if you can fix it, right? Yeah, they said this should be fun to work on because it's so little <laughs> yeah, and, the and it's a basket case of parts. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny. Yeah, it's kind of cool because it's little, but we were talking this takes the same amount of work as a three cylinder Perkins engine does. You a know, big three cylinder something Perkins. Something like that. Yeah. Um, except we have to do all these tooling changes because it's so small. Yeah. So it's actually, if anything, should cost more than that. But yeah. you, you can't charge what it's worth. It's a throwaway motor. Right. We can kind of find parts for it, but it looks like most of them are going to be shipped from overseas. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if you can even get all of the parts we need in the U.S. They're going to come. Well, that's it. When we start checking our normal sources, they don't cover this engine. Yeah. And you ended up on eBay yeah, on and eBay. Amazon eBay looking and for Amazon parts. And, uh, and that's where you found parts. That's where I found parts. And like I said, most, I mean, they literally say a month shipping time on a yeah. lot of them. So went as far as I could with the head. I think the head is savable. Is it savable for what you can buy in aftermarket, not Kubota replacement? No, no way at all. Right. You're going to spend more money than the $400 head that you can get from overseas, which may or may not be fine. Thought we'd go as far as we can on the block and see if maybe we could just touch it in the hone here but obviously that center cylinder that dropped the seat and the other two were on the way to dropping a seat but that center cylinder has that dark spot there where like you said probably is from it's it's cocked probably cocked the piston in the cylinder put enough side thrust on there that it actually dented the cylinder wall and I think you showed there magnifluxing it. We can't pick up any crack there, but uh, from experience, I know when you've got a cylinder like that that has a dent in the side, there's a real good chance that it is either starting a crack or all but cracked. And what's too bad is when it's pushing the, the cylinder wall out, the part that opens up first is inside the water jacket on the, or on the water jacket side of the cylinder where we can't see with the Magnaflux. So there may be more there than we're seeing. Yeah. It, it's enough to make me nervous. I would not feel comfortable uh, just boring that cylinder oversize. It's going to need a sleeve in there to fix that right. Yeah. So now we're talking sleeving, sleeving a cylinder on the block. That's going to cost money. At least one connecting rod is bent. Yeah, that's, um, that same connecting rod shows to be bent. Not so, a lot, but it's, it's not how it should be. And again, that's where we ran into another problem there. The little rod is too small to go on our... It's too, uh, to check on our straightening fixture. Yeah, or whatever. our straightening fixture. And you figured out a way to do it there on, the, uh, on a flat surface, but it's... Uh, it's a lot less accurate, and that's not actually going to check the two bores 
if the crank pin and the piston pin are Twi are twisted from each, each other, other that's yeah. going off the faces long story short no you you cannot you cannot charge what it costs on an engine like this to do it because the cheap aftermarket stuff is cheaper yeah. and this engine just flat out was not built to be remachined yeah they had when they built this they had no intention of anybody ever rebuilding it again uh, they figured it'd run its life and you throw it away and you go get another one. So at this point, I guess we tell the customer we can keep going forward with it, but there's no telling how much more we're going to run into. No. I mean, every time we turn around, there's one more thing that we hadn't thought of or, you know, one more little surprise or we tell them hop online and find yourself, see if you can find yourself a complete yeah. engine and we'll charge them a cleaning charge and yeah and even if and they do uh tell us to go ahead with this and are willing to pay the labor that it's going to take to finish this uh i'm going to tell them go find your own parts yeah. uh, because i know it's going to be a cluster trying to come up with all the parts and i don't want to be in the middle of it uh, when you get half of it in and you can't find that last little piece that you need so i'm going to put that back on the customer's table and if he's willing to go ahead with that, he can. And otherwise, we charge him for cleaning and checking this out and figuring out what it's going to take. And we cut our losses and move on. Yep. And for me, it was just kind of a fun little challenge. Can we, can we cut a <clears throat> counterbore in that head to mm -hmm. get a seat that'll fit? It, it was good experience. It really was. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. Yeah, it was good experience. And we knew that going in. We knew that uh, we might not be completing this job just wanted but, to see what we could do. Yeah, but it, that's, how we, that's how we figure out what our limitations are is by experimenting and trying different things like this and, and learning uh, as we go trying different methods to make repairs. Yep. 